Hello and welcome to our panel. Welcome to this virtual workshop and to everybody who is with us this afternoon in Europe and in Latin America. Welcome to our friends. My name is Christina Bilke Daniels. I am a director at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, and this workshop is an intercontinental cooperation of the FES, our colleagues in Berlin, and the Latin American Network for Inclusive and Sustainable Security. So thank you very much to all the colleagues in the team who organized this workshop and who made this virtual meeting possible to us. Thank you very much also to the interpreters who will be supporting us with German, English, and Spanish interpretation. So first of all, the organizers asked me to make a few housekeeping remarks so that this workshop can be as interactive as possible and so that uh, all participants who registered can follow and also make uh, as much use of this format as possible. So, as always, we would like to welcome your feedback, your comments on Facebook. Uh, we will collect comments and we'll try to come back to as many of them as possible. Registered users can um, use this chat, ask questions to the panelists, and it is also possible to participate in uh, a little poll or competition. But a few uh, remarks. First of all, you need to give yourselves a username. There will be a video stream in German, English, and Spanish, but we only have one chat for all languages, so no separate language chats. You are, of course, welcome to ask your question in any of the three languages we're working with today, and because our team will monitor the chat, we read all three languages, and we will make sure that our panelists get the questions. The complete video of this debate will be made available at a later point in time. The chat will not be published, but for purposes of documentation, it will be saved. Some comments will be selected. And uh, uh, my apologies, but we will not be able to attribute your names to the questions. We will, of course, not tolerate uh, violence, sexism, discriminatory comments, so that's our netiquette, no uh, commercials, no advertising, no spam. This will be deleted immediately, and we will monitor this. No, I would like to extend a most cordial welcome to Valeska Hesse. She is the head of the Latin American and Caribbean Department of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Berlin, so that she can make a few welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, Christina. Hello, everybody. Good evening to everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to our colloquium, to our forum on cooperative security in Latin America and the Caribbean. The question is, does the term cooperative security cover all the region or does it fall short of the region's reality? That's the heading under which we put this uh, conference. Security concepts in the region are highly relevant at the moment. This is a pressing issue because of the challenges of the Latin American countries. It is one of the main areas of work of the Latin American Network for Inclusive and Sustainable Security that Christina has alluded to already. This is a project that the foundation established in 2019 in order to talk about concepts, strategies, policies, so develop strategies with a higher democratic control and a greater inclusivity for all segments of the population in order to bring about better results than previously. With this in mind, the network has convened experts from academia. Some of them are with us today. 
and members of the civil society, of the social movements, uh, so that a broad debate can be instigated and we can cover the security challenges from many angles, both for individual countries and uh, for the citizens living in those countries. There is a high murder rate. There is a uh, homicide rate. There is a lack of conflict resolution me uh, mechanisms. There's militarism. There's uh, organized crime. There's web arms uh, trafficking and trafficking in human beings. In October last year, there was a first conference all participants of the panel will probably remember. Ever since, a number of publications have been issued. Uh, some of the participants also were interviewed. But because of the pandemic, the second conference this year will happen in the virtual space in uh, in November 20 uh, around November 23rd and we invite everybody who's with us today everybody who's watching to uh, stay up to date our network has a website and we are also present on social media so stay up to date as to what we're planning and I would like to use this opportunity to thank Christina Birke who directs our project in Colombia. First of all, thank you very much for um, calling into existence this network. This was the right point in time. And also, thank you very much for organizing this panel discussion, which will be very interesting. And thank you also to our panelists. Thank you. And I hope that we will have good, fruitful, and interesting talks. Thank you, Valeska. Uh, above all, thank you for the support that you have lent us from uh, your department in Berlin. As you said already, today is about whether cooperative security in Latin, uh, Latin America or the Caribbean, whether that term actually covers the situation. And I have to say that we have a high-level panel and I would like to introduce the panelists to you um, in alphabetical order. Number one, Mariano Aguirre, who is a journalist, an analyst for foreign policy, and he teaches at the University of Bilbao in Spain. He's an expert in international conflict and works in peace consolidation and peace maintenance, also humanitarian acts, um, aspects and development. He is also an associate fellow of the Program for International Security at Chatham House. He is well known as a senior advisor of the peace panel at the, uh, of the president of or the, uh, the secretary general of the United Nations. And he has been a member of the Norwegian Center for Conflict Resolution. And he also worked together with other institutions in close cooperation in uh, his capacity as a consultant. Lucia Damat is a professor at the University of Santiago in Chile. She's a sociologist, studied in Leiden in the Netherlands, studied political sciences and got a PhD there, and worked at various academic institutions in the United States, um, in Argentina and in Chile. A number of publications, uh, including books on security, participation, social conflict, cities, metropolis, planning issues in Chile and in international publications. In the public arena, she called into existence a public uh, a program for um, public security, for example, when it came to police reform in Chile, and she was a consultant in various fields. Thank you very much, Lucia, for being with us today. The third panelist is Wolf Grabendorf, who is a visiting professor for international relations at the Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar in Ecuador. 
He's a politologist or political scientist. He comes from Germany and is an international consultant. We know him mostly because he is the chair and the representative of various offices and programs of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Latin America. He studied history, sociology, and political sciences, um, also international relations in Fran Frankfurt, Iowa, and Berlin. And he also worked for the German Institute um, for uh, defense and, uh, and international relations in Berlin. Welcome, Wolf. And we also have the great pre uh, pleasure to welcome Arlene Tickner. She's a professor at the Universidad de Rosario in Colombia. Over two decades, she has uh, taught at the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia participated in uh, or got a PhD in international studies at the University of Miami and she also studied at the famous University of Georgetown. Her main areas of research comprise the sociology of knowledge and international relations as well as the developments of this discipline in the context of the global periphery. Now, I am absolutely grateful to all of you for participating in this workshop. For me, this really is a high-level panel. It's very interesting, so I would like us to start with the first question already. We have an international audience, so we thought that it might be interesting to have a first expert round in order to get a grip of the current state of the notion of security in Latin America, because this is a region that in Germany is always seen as the region with the lowest conflict level. Um, as far as interstate relations are concerned, but there are 37 percent, or 37 percent of all homicide cases happen in Latin America. This is a strong indicator for the fact that there are major challenges in the area of security. That also uh, become more and more noticeable at the international level. And in the 2000s, in Latin America, a number of security mechanisms at the regional level uh, had been developed also on conflict management, border conflict management, proliferation of nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, and uh, biological weapons, and with the goal of promoting trust. There was a greater level of cooperation across the board. I'm thinking, for example, of the great functioning of the Defense Council of UNASUR. Today, in the region, um, there's actually no regional cooperation at all. And this can be seen, for example, when we look at the uncertainty um, during the pandemic, which had disastrous consequences, this also has something to do with more traditional areas of security. For example, in the case of the Venezuelan crisis, where more and more geopolitical dimensions of security um, have appeared up to the controversy whether a military intervention in Venezuela would be possible or not. And this also, and at the same time, led to a situation where in the region military activity has um, uh, happened that uh, was th that, that exceeded all the previous dimensions of the previous decades in the Caribbean. Wolf, for a long time, you have been an expert, an observer in Latin America. Why do you think these mechanisms um, on cooperation in the area of security are no longer functioning, if you think that uh, this is actually a valid term? Wolf? 
Wolf, you would have to unmute yourself, please. You're still on mute, on mute. No. No. Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Bueno, muy buenas tardes, o buenas días. Yes, en now it's working. Tardes. Hello, good evening, depending on where you are. I think that the topic of this panel discussion is so important for the years to come, uh, because today there is actually hardly a topic except with the exception of the pandemic that is so important for most people in Latin America as security. The problem is that everybody has a different idea of security. In Europe, of course, this can be seen at the Tiergarten Conference, uh, people are thinking of external security, but in Latin America, really for historical reasons and also for structural reasons and for institutional reasons, um, we have the situation that the enemy is within. Depending on the era, it was the con uh, communists, the castrists during the, uh, or during the Cold War, the guerrillas. Now it's organized crime. And even in some countries, uh, there are paramilitary organizations. So the, the armed forces of Latin America, I think you have to understand this, um, represent a multifunctional way of exercising power. They not only uh, deal with defending the sovereignty of the country, they also deal with well, they're also about uh, steering and controlling the order and the development of the country. This is important to understand because this is a function that very much differs from the function of armed forces in other countries and regions. And if we look at the institutional situation, we have to consider that almost all Latin American countries uh, are hyper-presidial the, as far as their system con uh, is concerned. The president is the chief commander of the armed forces, and if the supreme commander changes, that's every four to five years, the vision of security changes. And with these changes, it's always very difficult to plan, to coordinate, or at the international level, to work together because the ideology of the president is basically that, um, yeah, it's the law of the country. The ideology is the law of the country. We've seen this a number of times in recent years. And we have to consider that, as many analysts and colleagues say in Latin America, that there is a situation of restricted or hybrid democracy, as we call it. And this kind of democracy, it's very important to, to take this into account. Here, in this type of democracy, the armed forces are the only well-organized organization within the society. The political parties uh, do not have a lot of leverage in this country. They don't have a lot of weight. So. With all presidents, whether they're left, right, democratic, authoritarian, they always want to be on television with the, uh, with the generals. And this implies that politicians try to legitimize themselves with the presence of uh, the armed forces. And that's a phenomenon that we don't have in this way in other countries, at least not in this order of magi uh, magnitude. And this is different. This, this uh, it has nothing to do with ideology. And for historical reasons, the armed forces in Latin America play a particular role, a role that uh, all governments also have to take into account and to understand this multifunctionality of the armed forces also implies that cross-border relationships with neighbors 
are actually the exceptions. This is not reality. It's not lived reality on the ground. And if it happens, it's usually more on a bilateral level. There are only two or three cases, um, or have only been two or three cases over the last uh, decades in Latin America, where there has been trilateral cooperation in security matters between Latin American countries. And this means that the armed forces are gar guarantors of the system. Maduro, Bolsonaro, uh, to very different politicians when it comes to their political views. But what they have in common is both need the armed forces in order to bring about stability in their own countries. A questionable stability, of course, from a democratic point of view. But at the same time, they can continue to govern. And this is why I believe that it is right not to think that a concept like cooperative security has a great future in this region, unfortunately, because the, ba the basic prerequisites aren't there. The conditions aren't there. If there's no cooperation at the regional level that works well, not even in trade, how is this supposed to happen in such a delicate area as security? The only possibility for cooperation in the area of security is to fight organized crime. And this is where a kind of institution is lacking, like a Latin poll, um, a, a corresponding to cor corresponding organization, Interpol. But many police forces in um, in Latin America are, are actually fall under the authority of the Ministry of Home Affairs or even Defense. So they also see their own work in the country completely differently from police forces in other countries that only combat crime. Thank you so much, Wolf. So in order to understand this role of the armed forces, both as far as their political uh, uh, alignment is concerned and their role in the development of the countries. Lucia, I would like to ask you. You um, talked about this phenomenon, militarization of the countries, and I wonder whether you share this perspective. And at the same time, it would be interesting to know whether you could talk about the original question, why it is so difficult to talk about cooperative security in the region. What do you think? And especially um, if we look at the problems of violence in the region, and um, if we look at the characteristics of such a cooperation tailored to this region. Thank you very much. It's uh, early in the morning here in Chile, and uh, it's uh, also a bank holiday. It's a national bank holiday, and that's why I'd like to welcome everybody. Three things. First of all, I would like to mention the fact that there are two parallel processes ongoing in Latin America. We have militarization of the police forces uh, increasingly, and uh, if you look over to Europe, then you have a kind of a civil police force, uh, police working with the communities, whereas in Latin America, there we have an increasingly militarized police force. The way they proceed, uh, also the arms they use, the equipment, and uh, their alignment. We see that in all Latin American countries, and that is very similar to what is happening in the United States of America. And on the other hand, we see a politicization of the military. This, these are military forces seeing conflict potential between the countries decreasing, but on the other hand, they have uh, large budgets for defense, which they cannot use uh, possibly for technological development or border protection, which is why in some countries, they have found a space where the topic of uh, intelligence uh, 
services uh, or activities and also control and patrolling. That's what they've been doing. So now we will have to make clear that we have this militarized police forces having very little knowledge of citizenship or perception, uh, which is why the citizens will not easily call the police when something happens. On the other hand, the relations between the people and the military forces are much better because they don't have a direct relationship with the military and uh, they don't necessarily have a connection with national topics or issues. So that's where they seek security. And so, if it were the case that we had something like a Maripol, I mean, that does exist, but uh, it's uh, being uh, used by the most heavily militarized police forces in South America and dominated by them because it's about training police forces and uh, training them in a military sense. And that has to be seen in the context of security because this concept is a political one. It's not a professional one as it is here in Europe. Uh, in uh, the United States, it's also very political. Now, for us, questions of security, especially uh, domestic security, but also, we're also talking about crime, organized crime, drug trafficking, and so on, anything being organized by smaller or larger groups, heavily armed with uh, many, many people involved and uh, lots of ammunition. These groups produce a lot of day-to-day -day crime. So all countries from Argentina to Argentina to Chile have the same problem with security. Security is a political topic and it will always play a role with elections. And that is why everything becomes a question of security and nothing is very concrete. When talking about security, then there'll be people saying that, okay, we're talking about uh, prison administration or repression and others will talk about prevention and combating crime. And I think when you want to professionalize this area, you need to go down a middle path. You have to differentiate between the military and the police, and you have to make sure that uh, the capabilities of the civil players are there, otherwise the police will self-administrate. I mean, there are some countries where there's civil authority, but in other countries there isn't. Now, room for cooperation, especially room uh, as uh, being presented here by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, that means that many players have to be included, many stakeholders, and you need to have uh, a diverse perception of security in the debate. Thank you, Lucia. It's true that here we are on a panel where we have all sorts of different concepts and forces we're talking about, but I'd like to get back to our original point. Concepts, notions of regional cooperation and cooperation in this sense, and here I'd like to give the floor to Mariano Aguirre, because he will also be able to shed light upon this topic, tell us what, historically speaking, has been going on in several Latin American countries. But uh, they have been moving under the umbrella of and the protection of the United States. And that, of course, opens up a completely new level to the discussion in terms of what's happening in the world today with the United States and uh, now currently in the current situation. And maybe we could ask you now to look at this a bit uh, from outside the box, uh, shed light upon Latin America and uh, foreign policy there and what that means for security policies. Thank you very much, and also thank you very much to the Ebert Foundation for inviting me. I believe that the United States at the moment 
um, don't really have a, a strategy for Latin America and the Caribbean. I think they, they pursue selectively. They're interested in Mexico because they want to col uh, control migration. They're interested in Colombia. This is mainly about the drug problem and the Caribbean. Then it's about trade and also the tax havens. Now, the position of the United States, uh, this selective position, um, has something to do with the global, with the position of the United States as the global hegemon. They're still important, but they, uh, but they don't have that much of an interest in the region. And uh, let me also point to the security agreement of 1997 between the, uh, the United States and countries of Latin America, and it's not working. There have been difficulties in some countries at various points, and this crisis in the United States has led to a fragmentation in the region because some countries have special relations uh, with Washington, others are trying to exert pressure on Washington to pursue their goals. This would prob uh, possibly be the case in Mexico. And others don't really know how to behave, whether they should uh, look at themselves or look for new strategic relationships with China, the European Union, or Russia. And then there are countries that want to play a regional role, like Brazil. Brazil always had regional ambitions or ambitions for regional leadership with an authoritarian regime of um, Jair Bolsonaro. Um, there's been new impetus for this. And then there's the case of Colombia, which um, has been a privileged partner of the United States and still has um, a lot of military support uh, agreements with the United States, and it also plays a certain role in the region. At present, uh, we can't take note of the fact that the crisis of the United States, the security crisis, uh, has something to do with these regional agreements that were concluded between the 70s and the 90s. It was about transparency, it was about arms control, non-proliferation, and um, yeah, nuclear non-proliferation agreements as well in this region. First, let's take note of the fact that there is hardly a real tracing and tracking, and that the, it, it's not being implemented. This crisis of the hegemony of the United States and the regional fragmentation, of course, this is serious. This is a complex situation. At the same time, it opens up the possibility to find new forms of security cooperation and to reinforce and build up on what uh, exists already, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, for example, which is also relevant uh, in the region, and alternative forms, democratic forms, in order to uh, bring about security. This is mainly about what Lucia uh, already addressed. And I think the main interest should be First of all, to um, talk about the, the high crime rate, it's first of all the national problem of every country, but it also has a regional dimension because of the organization um, and the way that it's organized. And we should talk about Venezuela and the Venezuelan crisis, not only because of Venezuela, but because this could also be a model for future crises and how to deal with them and uh, mediation and dialogue mechanisms in the region. How can they be expanded? How can they be strengthened? Uh, this can, could be helpful. To conclude, I would like to say, um, as uh, Wolf Gabendorf has said, that uh, security cooperation with other countries internationally, um, it works differently from uh, what we have in Latin America. So there's one concept, the Olof Palme Commission from the 70s that was about uh, joint security and shared security. This was about survival, essentially, 
um, in the light of the danger of a nuclear war and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. This could also be a model for regional security agreements. Now, this has a lot to do with the creation of trust. And this could also be done by the civilian organizations uh, to build up something like that. Thank you very much, Mariano, says the moderator. We saw that the definition of uh, security is just as complicated and as, uh, uh, as convoluted as what Lu uh, Lucia said. Now, a more difficult question. How can we guarantee that a better adapted concept will be accepted, something that could be acceptable to all citizens um, and it would be good for them that they could exercise their democratic control in the way that it's necessary. And as Wolf has said, um, the role of the military, which on the one hand is very important, but on the other hand also um, uh, is, uh, is outside the civilian control because people are just not aware of what's going on there. There is this Latin American network for a sustainable and inclusive security that is working on this, working on presenting a new concept. Could you uh, perhaps tell us something about this? We already heard from Mariano. Um, but, Aline, could you say us perhaps something, tell us something about the work that you're doing there in this network? What's missing for a new impulse for security so that this problem can be handled that you once quite rightly described as a community of insecurity in Latin America? How can this be remedied? What can be done? How can this goal be pursued? that uh, is reflected in this framework, sustainable and inclusive security. What's your work? Thank you, Christina. And I'd like to welcome you all as well. It's very difficult to put this in a nutshell when talking about the security concept in Amer Latin America. But of course, what we try to do is to create a network which is uh, under the umbrella of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And I'd first of all like to make a more general remark about what my colleagues said on the panel, and then afterwards maybe we could uh, explain a little bit more about this network. I think uh, what Lucia said was very important, namely the political aspect of uh, security and a security concept. You can also see that in academia, people try to conceptualize uh, security as a concept, and uh, they talk about security and international relations in Latin America in terms of trying to be practical so that uh, decision makers and responsible people can just use the notion. So it's always about the practical application of uh, theoretical thought. And uh, then it's quite difficult to think outside this framework. And there's no consensus between the different uh, academic circles in the region, not even with uh, people within security academia. And uh, I think, first of all, we can see some main tendencies. Some have already been mentioned. Now, one tendency is the fact that it's very different from other countries in the global north. When looking at South America, there's a very strong interlinkage between uh, the logical thinking in terms of international and national security. And uh, what we heard here as well is that the main source for security is a domestic one. It's not just about practical aspects, not just about uh, aspects uh, having to do with the security at a national level, but it's also to do with the developments which began in the 1980s. Now, we could talk about several of these tendencies. I'd like to just uh, pick one. In the 1980s, there was the notion of democratic security, which was similar 
uh, to cooperative security as uh, used as a term in uh, Europe. And uh, that had to do with the challenges of the transition between dictatorial or authoritarian regimes to democracy. And in Central America, it was about moving away from uh, armed conflict to peace. This uh, notion of democratic security was about uh, security and defense architecture with civil control uh, as opposed to the past and uh, respect for democracy. Those were two main assumptions which were not just in, uh, for the well-being of people in Latin America, but it was also a question of uh, the different generations. And I would like to disagree a little bit with my colleagues here. Security cooperation was not totally effective, but there were attempts to create institutional lies, structures for promoting uh, security cooperation. I think that's very important in the context of uh, democratic security. In the 1990s and the 2000s, cooperation was uh, directed at more of a general level. Uh, nationhood in uh, Latin America as such that was uh, an issue so people talked about the insecurity dilemma and from this dilemma of insecurity concepts were developed as uh, to uh, safety or security for citizens and that was also taken up by the United Nations but I think the dilemma lies in the fact mainly that our states dealt more with threats to the uh, state or the nation as such rather than uh, foreign threats. So what Bob just said is that you still have uh, interior enemies when uh, trying to identify threats. So you look uh, at the domestic scene and criminalize uh, these uh, sources of insecurity. And then uh, last but not least, I'd like to say that in recent times, as my colleagues also mentioned, we've seen a deep crisis of multilateralism in Latin America. And uh, that also affects security cooperation. There's a militarization of security within the organized uh, crime uh, circles, but also protests. And uh, that within a more general crisis of democracy in Latin America. So now we have new challenges. We will have to find new concepts of security which will be able to deal with the crises in this region. So I think that returning to the concept of uh, democratic security and uh, assessing what worked well at the time and what would still be necessary would be an interesting path to go down. Thank you very much, Arlene. This conference is being held uh, just a week after a large uh, clash in Colombia. We had uh, violence uh, perpetrated by the police in Colombia and in Mexico. So it is true that this discussion is being held within Latin America with all the facets we heard about. And this is also a very topical discussion, discussion at the moment. I would like to now remind uh, our audience that we have a poll. So if you have a bit of time, you could look at it. And uh, we have put some questions in there, which uh, we talked about with the panelists beforehand. We'd like to know your opinion on these. And uh, we would now go over to the seven, second round of questions. Uh, and uh, there, I would like to seize the opportunity, because this is the last of three days where we have uh, had all sorts of very different events. And after this analysis of uh, the notion of security in Latin America, as Arlene put it, 
it's certainly the case that it's uh, difficult to summarize this in three minutes. I'm sure we could have a whole conference just on this, and uh, that's what we are doing. But I think it could be interesting also for you to be able to tell us something about the notion and the relevance of the notion of cooperative security in Europe. As uh, we can now see in the European area, you always wonder, could that be relevant to Latin America or not? But I'd also like to shed some light on that. So let's do that. And of course, feel free to take the floor. Wolf, please. Right, it's working. I briefly wanted to come back to what Arlene said, who quite rightly said that the problem is that in Latin America multilateralism doesn't work, and it can't work, in my opinion, because compared to other regions, not just Europe, also compared to Asia, in Latin American countries, the situation we have is that we don't have like-minded states, as the Americans put it. These are not countries that, in their DNA, have this notion that they want to entertain good neighborly relations. This uh, was the case when there were presidents with similar ideologies who, for example, called into existence the uh, Security Council for Latin America. This worked well for a couple of years. Then we had regime change or governments change, and it, um, uh, and it stopped working. So in this context, I believe that the relevance of the term of cooperative security is actually not that clear to me. Because the structure in Latin America and international relations and uh, in the very legitimate concerns for the internal situation, all of this means that uh, there is no space for cooperative security. There's a new generation, maybe, that we, or we maybe we need a new generation that has been socialized differently and looks at security problems differently. With the clear exception of Cu uh, Cuba and Venezuela, there is no country that has any external enemies in Latin America. It just doesn't exist. Sometimes uh, there's a bit uh, of friction between Peru and Chile, but nothing really serious, which means that, as Lucia said, the military has a job that uh, doesn't really, that, that, that's really pointless. It's not about defending the country. It's about defending the government. That's an important issue, not just because of the budget um, issue, but also because without military, there is no governability, really. And it's not a coincidence that apart from the church, there's no institution that is as popular in Latin America as the military. There are a few exceptions, Argentina, for example, they lost the war, but in other cases, it is clear. So I believe that maybe some best practices from Europe in certain specific cases can be applied but the term itself, I believe, has no meaning, really, in the regions. Thank you very much, Mariano and Lucia. Thank you, Christina. As an answer to your question, let me say, first of all, that Normally, security concepts or the notion of cooperative security is interpreted as a collective security. Collective security 
um, is more about formal or informal agreements between countries, that's what Wolf said, like-minded countries that share certain values and visions, while collective security usually always has something to do with NATO. And I believe that at this moment, cooperative and collective security both are in a very difficult, difficult phase. I don't have time to enumerate all the reasons, but I can quickly touch upon them. Um, cleavages within NATO, emanating from two countries mainly, one country that time and again uh, deviates from the parameters of NATO, that's Turkey, and the great paradox, the attacks of the United States on their NATO allies during the entire Trump administration. And the Democratic candidate Biden said that this would be corrected. But it is true that the structural relations between the US and the allies have suffered for decades. There have been tensions and these tensions will continue. Even if the uh, attacks, the verbal attacks stop, then there's a the question of out of area operations. Afghanistan and Libya among them. Those were two real fiascos. And this, these conflicts continue even though there will be a peace agreement in Afghanistan. Then in Europe we have Brexit and the fact that, as we see in the case of Brexit, um, there was no possibility to come up with a common foreign and security policy. So security is um, hampered by problems that are not security problems in a narrow sense, but that lead to cleavages within NATO. Migration, for example, is another issue. A collective security has these, uh, is confronted with all these challenges that I just enumerated. I don't think that this is the same as in Latin America, but I think we can say that um, if Latin America doesn't, Latin America is not approaching Europe in this sense, but uh, vice versa, really. Lucia, do you agree, As the moderator? Yes, she says. It's a kaleidoscope of different factors. Because these analyses have a half-life of 24 hours, pro probably. We have short-term, medium-term, long-term analyses, and now we do 24, 48 hours and a week because everything changes so fast. I absolutely agree that it is difficult to conceive cooperation. There's not just ideological differences between the countries. There's also what we've seen in terms of the um, president, what the president, what happened to the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, Uruguay, a right-wing uh, uh, country, voted for the American candidate immediately. Six months ago, they would have voted against this candidate because that was a left-wing or left-leaning government, quite regardless of the security situation. So these ideological differences limit possibilities for cooperation. And then as a second factor, the conflict between China and the United States. We're between, uh, we're caught uh, between a rock and a hard place because we want to export to China, but we also don't want to risk our relationships with the United States. Then there's a pro-Chinese axis and a more pro-American axis, Colombia and Peru. This is also um, difficult when it comes to cooperation. That's questions such as uh, where do you buy weapons, where do you buy tools? This is not just a footnote. Ecuador and Bolivia. All electronic systems were purchased from the Chinese, not from the Americans. So these are strategic problems. And then there's the third axis, which is the post-COVID uh, uh, axis, 
in Latin America. Today, Latin America looks like the region that will be most affected by coronavirus. There's, it's a 30-year setback for the poorest, 10 years for the richest. There is a lot of inequality. And I believe that there will also be a potential for additional conflict, migration, tensions between countries, environmental issues. So we also need to look at what will happen in this region after COVID-19. This is a very important point as a moderator that you just addressed. A lot of problems won't stop once the coronavirus crisis is over. A lot of conflicts um, con will continue to grow. Then there's climate change, which also um, has an effect on uh, security in the regions. Arlene wanted to say something. Yes, just to add to what has been said, cooperative security for me is a big roof, an umbrella, under which a, ma a great many things can fall. Um, Mariano already made the, the important distinction between collective and cooperative security. And what we understand by cooperative security in Europe or in any other um, similar place of the world, there are two elements that make this possible uh, to understand the crisis of this model. I believe that the idea of community is most important. And this builds up. On, on the one hand, on spatial proximity, and on the other hand, on a mutual dependence. And up until recently, it had been assumed that um, this is based on democracy and liberal values. Uh, but there's a crisis, not just in Latin America, in the entire world, really. And I think that this leads to questions as to whether there are other possibilities to stimulate a sense of community if the uh, community of values and the values of liberal democracy, if liberal values in general are under fire. There's also been uh, talk of the DNA of the United States, or the, of states in general in, uh, in Latin America. I, and I don't just think it's a Latin American thing. This is the case in all modern states, including in, modern, in European states. The DNA is such, and in moments of crisis, such as now, which will uh, exacerbate after the coronavirus crisis, there will be one natural trend not to cooperate in order to um, look at more internal and domestic problems. It's not just about nationalism or populism from left, uh, the left or the right. This is about the historical essence of the state itself. If I look at anything like that, anything that could instigate a system of a, a belief of, into a community, uh, we talked about climate change, for example. Um, there is mutual dependency that becomes m greater and that makes it more urgent to find common solutions. I believe that um, the state so far has not functioned and has not been able to implement com uh, security, so we might have to look at other angles. During the pandemic, for example, we saw that sub-state actors such as uh, local authorities really play a major role. I've played a, ma a more important role than before. So there could be a possibility for cooperation at the sub-state level, but also when it comes to the civil society. The civil society also could come up with concepts, civilian concepts, civil concepts that could fill the vacuum. Um, but by way of a summary, I would say that the concept of cooperative security is in a crisis, but I do not accept that there is no alternative at all in such a key issue, because if we don't manage to address these central issues, then 
the world will collapse and everything will become worse. So I believe that this is not a question of yes or no. This is a question of how can we achieve this? Is it, it's a global duty, a global necessity. Thank you, Pauline. We have uh, now made some progress here towards a new approach, and now we have some questions from the audience, and I'd like to maybe take two questions together, and then we will begin with our first round of answers, and you can decide how to answer. First question, are there elements or institutional factors available to create conditions towards uh, cooperative security? And what would these factors be? That's the first question. The second question is the phenomenon of militarization and security in Latin American countries. That seems not to be just a regional phenomenon, but a national and uh, problem and very often affects many countries, not only in the region. And what does cooperation here then mean? And maybe another question, and uh, that again uh, has to do with the concept of collective security. Somebody is asking whether uh, notions of human security are discussed in Latin America. Does that also play a part? So these are the questions with which we'd like to go into the debate. And I'd like to ask the panelists to please answer the questions. You decide which questions you want to answer. Arlene. Maybe we can change the order of the questions. Now, the question of militarization of security and whether or not it's a regional or transnational topic. Uh, that's something I find very interesting. Something we haven't talked about yet and which is also important is the fact that uh, when we have a crisis in uh, cooperation at an intergovernmental level in Latin America, then we have it at other levels as well. Cooperation between the armed forces in Latin America is something which is uh, very resilient, however. So we do have uh, armed forces being part of the state structure, but it is also a part which cooperates, and they do communicate with each other. And uh, usually, this uh, is uh, not the case uh, in the same manner by uh, when uh, talking about the civil actors. Now, security, police forces, and the politicization of the armed forces, that may also be consequences of the same processes of uh, exchange and uh, socialization of the different uh, countries, which the countries haven't been able to shape properly. So this is what I have to add. Wolf, you wanted to say something, and please unmute yourself. I think this is a very complex issue. I have held conversations with generals from different countries, and I always heard the same. They say we want to carry on more or less as before in, the, in terms of a Security Council for Latin America, whether or not that exists. And uh, all heads of states, so all their bosses are stopping them from this. They do not want military cooperation, uh, which is not of a binatural nature. The good and strong relations in Latin America are usually bilateral, so multilateralism and military diplomacy has basically vanished. 
and that's been the case for three years now, but there is interest in this. The problem, however, is exactly that, uh, that the bosses of the armed forces are presidents, and the presidents are unwilling. They do not want to have diplomacy or relations with other countries and their armed forces. So that is an issue we'll really have to look at, because it's very important, especially in the context, uh, as mentioned here, where I believe that we will also see uh, social unrest over the next years. And with social unrest, we will see that no government in the region will be able to survive without the active involvement and support of the military. So we'll see how this is going to come about. Unfortunately, I do not have any kind of trust in concepts uh, going beyond the state concept because in emergency situations, it'll always be the national state uh, having the last word. Not politicians, but then it'll be the military. One of the generals, for example, said to me that uh, the moment we have to destroy food because the market will not be functioning in one or two years' time, then it is about survival. And politicians have no idea as to how to lead a country which is just struggling for survival. Yeah, that's an observation we've also made, especially in Mexico. It is uh, the fact that uh, the role of the military has uh, been uh, overburdened. On the one hand, uh, they're building hospitals, and then uh, they also construct solar energy hubs or they control the um, customs, is what Wolf just said. And so these are rules which don't really have anything to do with the understanding of military force. So, Mariano. Thank you. Now, I, Lucia, believe in what Arlene said. The states are not cooperating so much, but policemen and the military usually do look back on a long tradition of cooperation in the region. And uh, it doesn't even have to be cooperation in the narrow sense of the word, but it could be cooperating in uh, arms supply, for example, or procurement. And uh, then you have uh, cooperation in certain uh, limited areas. That's always the case with the police. But Colombia and Chile have played important roles here in uh, aligning and, and training police forces in the whole region. And that also has had an impact. That's clear. And we will see the consequences of this uh, and talk about it in the seminar on inclusive security. The notion of cooperative security is such a broad one that uh, in Latin America, the reality will lead to the fact that it's everybody's and nobody's responsibility, just, just the danger. And there are areas in Central America where this is even more important, and there it's a very difficult concept. And why is that so? Because, for example, there are very high levels of uh, children dropping out of school, uh, a huge amount of social problems, and so human security is really an issue affecting everybody. And when it affects everything and everybody, nobody feels responsible anymore. And I think that's the problem, especially in Central America. Thank you. Mariano. I'd like to compliment something Wolf said about the question of uh, the position of the state, the military, and politics, and uh, the whole context. And I'd like to talk about the case of Colombia. Now, it's quite interesting to see that in Colombia, you have the supreme military leaders of the armed forces. When you talk to them, 
cómo ocupar el Estado, ese 30-40% de la geografía colombiana. There has been an ongoing debate uh, for decades now in Colombia, whereby the presence of the state can be extended to the whole territory because uh, 30 to 40 percent of the territory are not being controlled by the state authorities. This may be anecdotal, but uh, when talking to high officers in the Colombian armed forces, and they have a strategy when they are confronted with uh, all sorts of plans for organization controlling areas of the whole territory which are not under their control, then they say, we'll have a look at it, and then we'll go there, and uh, then we will go into this territory and occupy it, but then we don't have the civil component uh, following. That's what they tell me. So then they are responsible for operations, they are responsible for carrying out uh, all tasks properly, and I think uh, there's probably some uh, truth to this. The civil state in Colombia there you can really say that the elites are very immobile. They are not going along with the military. I think it's probably not the same uh, for the other, for all Latin American states, but it is similar in some other Latin American states. And I think what Wolf said when he said that we talk about the role of the state and what's going to happen next, and Lucia also talked about it, we can see that, that uh, we have uh, social and economic regression in the region, and uh, it uh, is possible that these elites may return. The elites who are supported by certain uh, societal structures, they don't want to lose their privileges, and then they say, okay, we'll use the, use the military and the police forces uh, so as uh, to put through our own interests. And that's what Lucia said. I mean, it will be necessary to include this perspective in all debates on security. It's going to get more difficult, and uh, it's going to be more and more of these elites and their personal interests. But there are also some interesting gaps and openings, as uh, Wolf said, where it's not always the case that the military acts uh, as a, a one organization. I mean, there are differences, and sometimes these functions they have, uh, uh, they don't want actually to fulfill them what the elites are asking them to do. Thank you, Mariano. Thank you for this uh, further point you raised, talking about the importance of making new proposals, because this is a phase, a moment, which is of his, uh, historical importance for Latin America because of the reasons uh, and aspects we've been talking about. We've had some feedback in the Meantime, we have uh, the possibility to participate here and have an exchange, and there's been a comment on Facebook saying that the concept of security cooperation should uh, look more to the protection of human rights rather than more general issues. And uh, there I would like to ask our technical colleagues to come in, please. Can you give us the results of our poll? Because we had this poll, and the first question was, do you believe that militarization of security can be carried out individually by each state? And there we have a 50-50 answer, yes and no. And, uh, of course, we've seen, we have the possibility for all sorts of comments in this interactive phase of our event. And the second question was, what uh, 
cooperation mechanisms uh, serve the uh, challenge of uh, transnational organized crime. And uh, there, most people believe that neither the technical nor political cooperation alone can uh, meet the challenge, but only a cooperation of both, an interlinkage of both approaches can be a solution. And uh, we can see that this topic uh, is a very highly complex one. Now the third question. I don't know if we have it here, or do we have the answers, or are they still missing? Well, maybe we don't have enough participants in the poll, but we will see. We will see whether perhaps we will receive results for this last question uh, once we have enough participants and enough answers. I don't know exactly whether the panelists still have any comments on, uh, on this uh, last bit. Arlene? Yes, I actually wanted to address this question, a question of un, uh, organized crime, too. Apart from topics like environmental crisis and the pandemic, uh, we, well, the organized crime, of course, is a big issue. It's a key concern, a key source of um, violence and threats in, in the region. Talking about the paradox again that Christina alluded to, the, the fact that we are in a region where basically we have democracy, as incomplete as it may be, uh, but at the same time the most violence uh, of the world. I mean, if you look at it, it, this is a question of organized crime, and despite the question, that despite the fact that this is so. I would like to point out that the cooperation around this phenomenon, which is the core of transnational threats, um, in my view, is still insufficient in order to effectively deal with the order of magnitude of the problem. The solutions that are being offered are mostly national proposals, apart from technical and political proposals. Um, but these approaches are mostly national. And if we look at it historically, on a timeline or timescale of crime and criminal activity, we see that um, it's a snowball effect, really. We see a lot of snowball there, uh, effects. And Latin American countries are not successful in fighting organized crime. So what's happen, what happens is the problem is then relayed to other countries and regions in Latin America. So I believe that the question of organized crime is a wake-up call, a wake-up call that underlines the necessity to find new, stronger cooperation in security. Because if it really, if there really is a pressing problem, then it is this. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. As Wolf and Mariano do. No, Wolf wants to say something. With the microphone, please. Please unmute yourself. Yes, I absolutely agree that organized crime is one of the most important problems, one of the most pressing problems. But let's look at the history. There are at least three Latin American countries that long before drugs um, had cultures of violence, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. And um, back then, there, are, there have been many, many uh, fatalities, organized crime, at least in the form as we've known it. Um, there are several studies on this. and. Um, most electoral campaigns, for example, 
had been paid for by organized crime. So it, there's a sort of legality of crime. The state is a part of the business of organized crime. This is not only the case in Mexico, where it's obvious, but also in other countries. So um, this brings me back to what Mariano said. Um, they will have, they will use every possibility to seize power and if they, the, the, the elites, and if there's no, if there are no free elections, then there will be, they will use force. And if the military doesn't help, it'll be organized crime. This is the context that we have to see this in. Not just say that organized crime is the only problem. There is a very close connection between the political systems, not in all cases, of course. It's always very difficult to make general statements. But there are enough examples that certain politicians um, have a very close relationship with organized crime and thrive well on it. Thank you very much, Wolf. Lucia. Yes, just briefly. Of course, the thought um, that there is a um, fight of the state between uh, against organized crime, that's obsolete. There's a great gray area, big gray area, but uh, yeah, corruption has a role. Drug capital is uh, or the, the, those who own the capital, and the, those the drug capitalists are not in jail. Those who are in jail are the weakest links. They are the useful ones. Um, and if the elite, well, um, I, I, I am a bit op more optimistic as far as the elites are concerned, because I, well, as far as the development is concerned, because there's a lot of social protest. There's a middle class. Uh, a lower middle class, if you will, that will be impoverished or that already has become impoverished. And uh, there will be a lot of pressure towards um, a new kind of social contract. And this could lead to a situation where the force, where violence will erupt again. Or that there will be protest, where the elites will then again uh, draw on the military or police forces. But we'll have to see how the police forces react to this. Thank you very much, Lucia. So, to summarize, we have a very complex image of Latin America, uh, also very worrisome. But I believe that we've just had a very good overview, and it was a good thing to look at all the facets. I thought it was fascinating. I would like to come back to one question that we had asked the audience, if it's possible to get the answer. Maybe this can summarize things a bit. We asked whether a cooperative security initiative in Latin America could thrive. We, of course, like to be optimists. We will continue to ask this question. And participants largely voted yes. Perhaps you could tell, give, briefly give me an answer to this third question, coming to the conclusion of this event. Then. Who would like to start? I'll go. Or Mariano? Mariano. Mariano. He's a gentleman, actually. No, he'll, he'll let you go first, Arlene. Okay. So, if we look at this question today, of course, it would be wishful thinking to say yes. 
But in the past, it was possible. It used to be possible. Latin America is a region that, for better or for worse, and we don't want to discuss whether the multilateral systems have worked or not, but it is a region where there have been difficult, different multilateral attempts in the sense of cooperation and joint problem solution. And security has been one of these issues. Of course, there's also been a perception of community. There has been talk of a notion of region that we need. I think this is important, but there's also a sense of community, and this is the basis for cooperative security. I believe that the challenge for Latin America is not only that a lot of the good things that we've had in the past will, can be yeah, revitalized, but um, that to analyze the current situation and to project it into the future, this is not about yes or no, this is about how. If we don't ask ourselves how to do this, we are talking about a crisis with, with very different facets, many different facets, a crisis that will become worse and that will lead to major problems for the citizens of Latin America. Thank you, Arlene. Mariano. Yeah, first of all, I absolutely agree to what Arlene said. I would just like to add that well, I'm normally not that optimistic. Um, my listeners usually leave the events um, a bit more depressed uh, than this, but uh, apart from this, and in addition to what Alina said, there are processes and actors, and in the case of Latin America and other regions, but we're talking about Latin America now, I would say that yeah, there are other players and actors in Latin America, but there are also other players Latin in, in, in the United States and in Europe. And there, there are movements, there are um, social currents that show us and I'm not saying that uh, we'll all be happy in the end, that there will be alternative security, but there is a series of social and political movements, even within the elites, also even within the military. There are some actors um, uh, that are different because it's not just a homogeneous um, uh, entity. And this opens a chance for political solutions. So this is not just um, optimism. This is based on facts. For example, the big tensions concerning migration um, between the border, uh, at the border between Mexico and the United States. There are analysts on both sides of the border who tell us that vis-a-vis um, -vis a brutal policy uh, of the Trump administration, which violates human rights, there's also the possibility to, um, to, to use the judicial system against this. The churches have possibilities, the social movements have room for maneuver. So I'm not saying that this will lead to an actual alternative, but this is also part of the reality. Thank you very much, Mariano. I am quite sure that um, the organizers would give me uh, another few minutes so that uh, Lucia and Wolf can also make some final remarks. I think Wolf was first. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, he's also a gentleman, so Lucia. Thank you very much. In conclusion, I would like to strike a more optimistic note, a realistic uh, viewpoint. I think this is a very, it's a scenario which is still moving. And uh, I think in the flux of this scenario, maybe we will see some crystallization points which can lead us to certain common points. 
But I think we do have to be very careful about the post-corona era because there are strong threats to democracy from populism to ever stronger military interventions. And for the Latin American countries, we have the two axes uh, where we can see challenges in ideology and uh, with the confrontation with the United States and China. So we'll have to take that into account. And uh, if we, when we meet in November uh, and see each other with the network meeting, then we will know more of what is going to happen. Because after the corona crisis, well, the corona crisis will probably end sometime next year and we will enter into the post-corona era. Yes, Christina. I hope uh, you won't call me a pessimist again, but uh, I am afraid that uh, we are now standing at a point where, which is pivotal, and uh, this began before the corona crisis. The corona crisis only makes uh, this uh, great change clearer. So I think, as Lucia said, that after the pandemic, uh, the topic of China and the United States of America will be so strong that it will have very strong repercussions on the region, much more than we could ever imagine. Because one day, the elites, when they see that uh, they have to sell their, sell their goods, be it minerals, be it food, then they will have to make deals with the Chinese as they had to arrange themselves with the Americans before. It's about uh, keeping the privileges and keeping in power. And that will happen at a domestic level, but also at a geopolitical level, and it will have very strong repercussions. Uh, when I talked about geopolitics 30 years ago, people said to me, oh, you know, that's a topic which is not of any kind of importance. But nowadays, uh, geopolitical agendas are much more decisive, and they will be ever more important. We see that not only in the case of Venezuela, we had the first visit of Fernandez outside Latin America. That is going to be to Beijing in uh, November. So that means something. And uh, the reaction of the United States um, concerning the Inter-American Development Bank is another indicator. And in Brussels, people fear that the Europeans will find themselves between these two blocks. And uh, so anything we can talk about today makes sense in a more or less uh, tranquil international situation, but in a very difficult uh, international situation and in an international system which is completely changing now, which is nearly uh, anarchical, I do not see a possibility to make changes at a regional level. I don't think you can act at a regional level, but as Arlene said just now, you have to act at a sub-national, sub-state level and not with the foreign cooperation, because that would happen at a national level. Thank you. We're now at the end uh, of uh, an interesting discussion. We talked about the challenges uh, in uh, security, but also cooperation in uh, South America. We've seen that they are huge. And uh, we are all worried about the future because uh, for the moment it doesn't look like as if there were political will to find a solution. In the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, we always uh, look for people who work with different democratic perspectives uh, searching for solutions and strategies towards a better future, and strategy for the future. And uh, as you see, we do that with uh, very inspiring minds. So if you like the discussion, then we will uh, see you on the conference in November. At the conference, do follow us on the social media and uh, get involved for our newsletter 
We look forward to your comments and uh, looking forward to everybody interested in these so highly topical debates about the future of Latin America. Thank you very much for your interest and uh, we applaud our panelists. It was an honor and a pleasure. See you back soon. I also thank the technicians who made this event uh, possible. Everything worked very well and we are now to the point. Very punctual, thank you.